Peter Alexander on the phone, uh, our national correspondent who's been covering the White House and has the latest on this. Peter? Andrew, yeah, we're getting new details on exactly what is happening here, but here's the best of our understanding, having spoken to people very familiar with the relationship between the United States and Russia. They say, based on uh, what was just published on the Treasury's website, this is the Treasury Department saying that it's going to allow companies to do some transactions with Russia's security service, FSB, as you said, which is important because that is the successor to the KGB, the most coercive instrument in the Russian state, as it was described to me by this expert just moments ago, despite the cyber sanctions that have already been, uh, that had been put in place by the former president, President Obama, his administration, U.S. intelligence agencies, as you know, had accused the FSB of being involved in the hacking, the interfering um, during the 2016 presidential election here as well. So that's what we know at this time. They specifically say that this is going to allow companies to do some transactions with Russia's FSB. Now, whether or not it is specifically easing sanctions that pre-exist or allowing a relationship to be constructed around those sanctions, that language we're trying to get more specifically, but this is breaking as we speak to you right now. Thank you, Peter Alexander, and Bill Cohn is still with us. Bill, it does seem from what we're seeing on the Treasury Department website that this is the first step towards easing sanctions on Vladimir Putin's intelligence service. What we have to think about is Russia conducted an attack upon the heart of our democratic system, which prompted the imposition of sanctions. For the president to now send the signal that he's going to weaken those sanctions will undermine all of our allies who have followed our lead and thereby reward President Putin for not only having annexed Crimea, destabilize the rest of Ukraine, but attack the United States uh, through a cyber attack uh, trying to alter our election. Uh, so this is another example. Did the Secretary of State, did Mr. Tillerson get any kind of a briefing before this action was recommended? Is this simply going to be Treasury making the decision, not the entire team? So now Mr. Tillerson has to go and defend this to all of our allies who have taken considerable risk economically by imposing these sanctions? This is not uh, um, this is not working in in a fashion that needs to work. But if it's going to be ad hoc, we're going to have another uh, rabbit hole that we're running down. We're running down this rabbit hole from yesterday's. Uh, uh, he's going to keep everybody guessing on their feet and not being able to really focus on the key issues, and that is focus on what needs to be done to preserve this country. And uh, I, I think we have um, a real problem for us. Well, th there is a principles committee, and there's a deputies committee. There are num numerous committees that are very important working groups that are subsets of the NSC. Right. And right now, you don't have the principles committee. You don't have the deputies committee. You don't have deputies in any of these departments, to say nothing of cabinet secretaries. And you don't have anyone other than the people immediately around the president, Steve Bannon, mm -hmm. who is on the principles committee, by the way, by by memo from the White House, a seat at the table, not just like David Axelrod sitting in the back and observing, but sitting at the table helping to develop the policies that are then presented to the president. But we have not had a single meeting of the NSC or of any of these other groups. You know, it seems very ad hoc. It reminds me a, a bit of uh, back during the Nixon era when President Nixon offered uh, transcripts of the uh, tapes that were recording conversations. And many of those transcripts had material not relevant deleted. And I'm thinking here that there's a, there's a comparability here because what he's saying, well, we'll let the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and we'll let uh, Dan, Senator Dan Coates uh, in on uh, issues which um, involve their interests. Well, who determines that? Uh, you're cutting the uh, the chairman of the, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He ought to be in every meeting unless he decides not to come, not to have the White House decide the chairman of the Joint Chiefs really doesn't need to be here. Why and not? And let me just point out that you were a freshman House member on the impeachment committee of Richard Nixon. You had to deal with this in real time and had to deal with the challenge of an impeachment of your own party's president. I did. And look, I'm hoping that President Trump is going to be successful. I, uh, I, I, I don't want to see him fail. I know he's carrying out promises that he made, but I think he has to carry them out in a way that respects the process whereby you can have a formulation of a comprehensive policy so you don't treat every issue as a 
a transaction. If you treat every issue as a transaction as you do in business, then you have no theme. You have no overall comprehensive strategy so that if you take a, an action in one place, it may in fact disrupt a policy in another. And I need to, uh, I would like to see a comprehensive strategy, one that is formulated by the entire team. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.